when the real problem is you don't have enough staff. Um, and, uh, and of course, staff is the biggest expense uh, for an employer, in, in, especially in healthcare, because that's what it's about, <laughs> is people caring for people. Um, and uh, so they have lower staffing levels in, in for-profit homes. And therefore, they have less care. Hello, I am Celia Sanker, Executive Director of the Diversity Canada Foundation, the organization that brings you GoldenVoices.com, the online portal where seniors gather to focus on issues of importance to seniors. At GoldenVoices.com, you will find the Golden Years Fireside Chat series, where we look with experts and everyday seniors at issues under the theme of living longer and living well. Today we will be speaking about an issue that has come up a lot, maybe in even in your conversations over the last uh, 18 months or so, and that is long-term care and how these uh, facilities are run. More specifically, we will be looking at for-profit long-term care facilities, and these are long-term care facilities where the owners are private corporations which have the uh, aim of taking dollars out of the system and putting them into the pockets of the shareholders. Is this a good thing for the residents who live in these facilities as well as the staff that uh, work to take care of them? And is this something that should be happening in Canada? Well, our guest today is a researcher who certainly thinks it should not. It should not be happening in Canada. We will be exploring that in today's episode of the Golden Years Fireside Chat. So today we are joined by Pat Armstrong, Distinguished Research Professor of Sociology at Toronto's York University and Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Pat is also a board member of the Canadian Health Coalition and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Her work focuses on the fields of social policy, women, work, and the health and social services. Pat is widely published. She has co-authored and co-edited a number of books in this field. Earlier, earlier this year, she co-authored an article that appeared on the online portal, The Conversation, theconversation.com, that carried the unequivocal headline, we must eliminate profit making from child care and elder care. So no question about Pat's position on that issue of the for profit model. Pat is principal investigator of two current studies, reimagining long term residential care an international study of promising practices and healthy aging in residential places. So it's a privilege to have you uh, join us today to share insights on this topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Would you give us, to start off, an overview of the spectrum of support and care that seniors need as as they age. I think there's a big difference between what they need and what they get. <laughs> and what you get varies considerably, not only across the country, but also where you are in a country. As, uh, as well, we all age every day, right? So, uh, and increasingly, as we get older and older, we do need uh, more supports. But many of the supports we need are the supports we all need, which is social connection, and the ability to get out in the community. And so one of the sports I keep saying that we need are clean sidewalks so that you can actually you know, walk to the store. And what we need are shops in our local area so we can not only get what we need, but that we can communicate with people. Now, there are other, of course, services that we might need. Some of the most important, surprisingly, may be uh, the ones that help you keep your house clean. <laughs> so that that you know the area you live in is clean 
And of course, we also have things like Meals and Wheels, and it depends where you live, whether you have access to that kind of service. Uh, in terms of care at home, again, access varies to some extent. There are certainly government home care programs that primarily provide either direct medical care or some uh, care with what are called the activities of daily living, which by which they mainly mean things like helping you get to the toilet or helping you uh, have a bath. So we have some of those services at home, not nearly enough, and they're not equally uh, distributed across the country and they're not equally accessible to all, although uh, it is a government program uh, in terms of home care. It's just very limited in terms of the hours you get and the kinds of services you get. We have some uh, assisted living, uh, which are uh, residential places, basically, where you can, again, get some care, perhaps with uh, cleaning your place, perhaps with meals, perhaps with some uh, home care in those places. And then we have, for uh, many people, what are called retirement homes. But because they, we don't have nearly enough places in, for sake of ease, I'll call nursing homes, places where you get 24-hour care, more and more people who need 24-hour care are going into retirement homes. And for the most part, retirement homes are privately owned and they can cost an awful lot of money, uh, over 100000 a year. And that's often without any care provided. Now, there's uh, it's often home care provided in those retirement homes, so limited number of hours of, of support. But then you come to what we have been studying most, which is long-term residential care, as it's called in Ontario, what is called in many places nursing homes, which are places that provide 24-hour care and receive most of their money from the public purse. They're mostly publicly funded. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, and I know for most people, the earlier part <laughs> of the, the spectrum, the, the, where you are in your own home and you're receiving supports, that's the ideal. Unfortunately, as time progresses and our needs grow, um, the long-term care model is, is where, uh, you know, where we end we end up we always have to remember there are lots of people don't have homes <laughs> and um, we also have to remember that many people's homes are not suitable for care even if we renovate them you know i live in a really skinny old victorian uh, and my where i work is three stories up <laughs> that's you know uh, not easy to renovate to uh, provide uh, care at home uh, so uh, part of what we've been working on is to try and make nursing homes a positive option, not the last and worst place to go. Um, help us understand a bit more about the traditional model of the long-term uh, care provision. Uh, so we talk about the for-profit model and the not-for-profit model, who are the actors involved and how are those two different models different? Well, we can start with the not-for-profit model, if we can take a closer look at that. It's hard to tell which, where, how far back to go in history, right? Um, when we came out of the, uh, the Second World War and we expanded uh, Canadian health care, um, public health care, that is, we had a lot of focus on hospitals. We had high, uh, psychiatric hospitals. We had uh, what we now would call acute care hospitals, general hospitals. And we had chronic care hospitals and we had rehab hospitals. A lot of the people who are now in long-term care would have been looked after in one of those hospitals. Um, because when I first started to study uh, long-term care in this province, which isn't all that long ago, um, that you weren't allowed to have any medical devices or you couldn't have oxygen tanks, you couldn't have catheters, you couldn't have any, it, they weren't seen as medical places. They were places that provided you with the supports for daily living. And as, as we often hear that many of the residents used to drive there and you know go out for a drink and um, 
if you if you go to a long term care home today, you you will see that we've closed a lot of the psychiatric hospitals. We've closed the chronic care hospitals. We've redefined uh, general hospitals to be about acute care, just what we can do to fix you now. And if we can't, then uh, you're supposed to go to a nursing home. And we haven't, uh, in any sense, kept up uh, for, with the demand for people who need 24-hour care and that that can't be provided uh, in a home. Uh, so, uh, so we have to understand that the whole population that needs nursing home care now is very, very different than it was even 25 years ago. Um, and we call it long-term care, even though most people now are now there for less than uh, two years, uh, because it takes it, it's so long to get into a long-term care home, uh, and your needs have to be so great that, that you don't get. So it's important to know that as a background. So when we're talking about this earlier period where they were more uh, supports with daily living, we had three kinds of ownership models. We had uh, we had some for profit uh, right from the beginning, but they were were small for profits. Usually, a, a family, often a nurse and her partner, uh, took an old mansion and and turned it into a, a nursing home. That it was for profit in the sense that it was private, um, and and they might have made some extra money, uh, but for the most part those private for-profit ones were small and not family-owned. Then we had ones that were not-for-profit that were owned by religious organizations or community groups, or, you know, the Italian community, the Greek community, the uh, Chinese community uh, would, would build homes and provide uh, services. And then we had ones that were uh, owned by uh, the public and for the, uh, those are, uh, in Ontario at least, almost exclusively owned by the municipality. There was a big scandal about uh, the nursing homes uh, in, uh, in the late, uh, in the 60s, basically. And uh, as a result of the discussions that went on then, uh, the government, the provincial government said uh, every municipality of a certain size would have to have a home, uh, provide uh, a, a home for long-term care. So we still have the City of Toronto, for instance, has 10 of them um, that they own. And so for the most part, the public homes are uh, owned municipally. And that's the, the kind of historical legacy we had. Now, there was a big change uh, with uh, the uh, Harris government when they put uh, the owners, the homes that the government subsidized and they pay for bed uh, up for a bidding process. And it was a bidding process that really favored um, corporations who, that had the resources and the facilities uh, to put in the management skills to put in the kinds of bids you had to put in uh, in terms of long-term care. And that's when we start to see a real shift to ownership by corporations rather in terms of what's private rather than by family homes. And uh, now that accounts for about 58% of all of the bids in Ontario. We have the largest proportion of for-profit ownership of, of any jurisdiction in Canada. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that uh, gives a, a good understanding of well, how we're where we're at today. Um, and it's a bit surprising when you think about Canada as being um, seen as a model of um, social health care, having for profit in long term care. That, that is a, a contradiction of, of what we what obtains in other parts of the healthcare system. Well, it's, it's important and I should have said, I guess, that whether you're for profit or not for profit or a municipal home, you all all get the same amount of money from the municipal government. So we're publicly funding those homes. Everybody pays a fee. Those fees are are very carefully controlled by the government. They're set at a rate to make it actually uh, possible for anyone to be in them 
um, because the government will subsidize you if you can't uh, pay these uh, quite low fees, relatively uh, speaking, to get into them. So, that, so it's important to understand that. In Canada, we think of our best love social program as being health care, as you say, uh, and, and that's about the Canada, that Canada Health Act of being a very big symbol of that. But the Canada Health Act explicitly excludes uh, nursing homes. But it's also important to notice that the Canada Health Act doesn't prohibit for-profit delivery of hospitals. Um, however, uh, we haven't had a tradition. Uh, uh, we've had a few for-profit hospitals. We don't have any as far as I know right now. Um, in part because the regulations are, are of a sort and the uh, workload is of a sort that it's hard to make profit in this area in, in terms of the way uh, we operate hospitals. But it's actually been the reverse in the case of retirement homes and, in, and nursing homes. They get guaranteed payment, they get guaranteed fees, they get a guaranteed full house. So it's not a bad investment. <laughs> How are these uh, um, facilities regulated? They all um, are regulated under the same uh, regime. This, and some of these regulations are very detailed. The research we've done for our big international project showed that we, what we did was look at scandals and what happens after you have a scandal. And, and, we, there, and we have... Norway, Sweden, Germany, the UK, the US, and Canada in this study that is now complete. But in any case, uh, we looked at scandals in all this, those countries and what was the most uh, likely response? Well, the, first of all, the scandals were most likely to happen in for-profit homes, which are much more common in the United States and, and Canada and Britain, uh, uh, not very common in uh, the Nordic countries. Um, secondly, uh, the most common response was to introduce more regulations. When we were doing our research in the United States, they said the nursing homes are more regulated than the nuclear industry, uh, in part because there's been more disasters in them. Uh, and, and the response has been more and more detailed regulation, but often more and more detailed regulation of the people who provide the care rather than the people who own the care. And, and so it, it will, <laughs> the regulations will be um, about detailed rules in terms of how the staff can deal with restraints or whatever, when the real problem is you don't have enough staff. Um, and, uh, and of course, staff is the biggest expense uh, for an employer, in, in, especially in healthcare, because that's what it's about, <laughs> is people caring for people. Um, and uh, so they have lower staffing levels in, in for-profit homes and therefore they have less care. That's, that's interesting that um, it is the staff that, uh, you know, bear the brunt of any reforms that come in after a scandal. But before we leave scandals, if you don't mind me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I Regulations on paper aren't good enough. If, if we're not uh, inspecting and if we're not enforcing those regulations and if there aren't any consequences for not meeting those regulations, even the ones that are very useful and very important, um, then, then they aren't very... <laughs> regulation doesn't really matter in that sense. And in Ontario, we have really dramatically reduced the, the number of inspections. We basically do them in response to complaints. And nothing much happens if, if they don't do anything about uh, what they're told to do afterwards. That does not bode well for uh, the highest standards being experienced by the residents and the staff. Uh, so. You know, I'm trying to wrap my brain around this. There is a, as you mentioned, there is a set amount that's provided by the public purse, by the uh, provincial government to all long-term care facilities, whether for-profit or not-for-profit, uh, a set amount for living cost. So the individual and their family pay 
a certain amount for room and board, if we call it that, and the province pays a certain amount for health care cost. Have I got that right? Is that how it's structured? Yes, it's it's the money in um, Ontario. First of all, it varies a bit based on what's called the acuity of the residents, the indic, you know, how how what their care needs are. But most everybody needs the, as much care as you could it, are in the highest category. So there is some variation. Then it arrives, and you're quite right. It's a, a, there's a what the fee is called an accommodation fee. It's supposed to be a, basically to pay what you would pay in your own home to uh, you know your bed and your uh, and your food. Or, well, not necessarily food because the 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 money comes in envelopes. One envelopes for staff. One uh, one there's one for food. Uh, so. Uh, it's it's specified in certain areas, and theoretically, if the money doesn't get spent on those areas like staffing, it's supposed to be sent back. But there's lots of ways of uh, moving the edges, let's say, um, and and there are some areas where profits can be made, like in um, not not just in the fees, uh, but but also in other areas uh, of the, where they're allowed to have charges or in in, in um, areas like food, for instance. Yes, precisely. That, that's why it, I'm having difficulty understanding. When you have um, costs to take care of accommodation and costs to take care of um, health care, where is the wiggle room for profit? How does the for-profit organization take dollars out and hand it over to their shareholders? What's lost in there for the residents? That's a good question. <laughs> um, in spite of the fact that they uh, claim that all the money for staffing goes for staffing, we, we definitely know that they have uh, lower staffing levels. There's, the data are, are really clear on that, lower staffing levels. They also pay less. Um, so um, that's that's one area where you can make money. You can make some money on uh, accommodation and on other uh, services, uh, but it's still somewhat of a mystery to me how their profits can be as high as they are. Now, it, it should also be said, not only do um, the uh, municipal uh, homes uh, spend a lot more on direct care, they also often get some extra money from the municipality. The city of Toronto, for instance, does give uh, money to the municipal homes for extra, uh, for extra kinds of things like behavior awards and that sort of thing. So Pat, why uh, did the for-profit model emerge this in the hands of uh, large corporations? What problem with the not-for-profit model was uh, the emergence of that model uh, there to solve? Well, uh, in terms of the justifications that were offered, um, uh, one of them was uh, that they, there's an assumption that the private sector is more efficient than the public sector. We have uh, no evidence of that in the sense of this isn't making wi widgets or, um, you know, even cars. This is caring for people. And your most important uh, expenditure is your labor force, as I said before, and how much you devote for that, how well educated they are, uh, what kinds of working conditions they have uh, is is about the kind of quality you get. And if if it's hard to make that more efficient in long-term care in a way that would uh, save you a lot of money. Um, so they aren't more efficient. There's, there is an argument too that uh, when you uh, have the private sector that what you get is competition that will lead to uh, choice and better quality. Well, we have so few beds in our long-term care homes that people don't have a choice. You're allowed to list three homes 
that you want to be in. And I was talking to someone the other day that said they applied two years ago uh, to go into long-term care. They were determined to be eligible and they just got a phone call, uh, offered to go into one of the homes that had the worst record in, during the pandemic, the highest death rate and the most uh, COVID cases. Um, this, this isn't consumer choice. <laughs> um, uh, so, so that argument about improved quality, improved choice, improved efficiency, none of those worked. And the other argument was that, that the private sector had the money to invest in these homes, except the government has the money. The only, the only difference is that instead of us paying up front right now to build a home, we, we keep it off the books this year by making a contract to the corporation and we pay them over a longer period of time. It's like, like you know, mortgaging your house. Except that at the end of this mortgage, we don't own the house. They do. <laughs> so, and we're paying long, more in the long run. So it saves the government no money. Because we're, as we've talked about earlier, they, they give the same thing. We have seen no improvement in quality. In fact, we've seen the reverse. We have seen no improvement in choice because the government hasn't expanded uh, the number of beds. And when we look at what people choose, those three choices I mentioned, they're way more likely to choose a municipal home, a public home, than they are to uh, choose a for-profit one. Is there any way to salvage the not the for-profit model? Are there tweaks that can be done um, since it's what we have today? And as you say, 58% of the beds are for profit in for-profit facilities. Are there ways to tweak things to make this work for uh, Canadians? I think it's going to take more than tweaking. Um, I don't think that we can, uh, you know, blow them up or walk away right now. Um, nor, nor do I think we should. But I, I think in terms of uh, Ontario, we cannot renew their contracts. And um, that, because the contracts are coming up in many of these homes, we, that, so I'm, I'm talking about a progress movement uh, towards moving away from a not-for-profit. I also think in, in the meantime, we have to uh, set our standards in a way that makes it harder and harder to make a profit. To go back to your earlier question, that we have to make it more and more difficult to realize a profit, to ensure that all of the money is going for care uh, rather than uh, to profit, and that we can do that through regulations, through inspections, through monitoring the money in different ways. So uh, I think we need to move in that direction. I think we should move in it uh, fairly quickly, and we know uh, from the data we have in terms of the pandemic that uh, the for-profits were worse than the uh, municipal homes or the not-for-profits. It's not that the municipal homes are perfect, nor are the, are the not-for-profits. Um, they're certainly not perfect, and there's lots of room for improvement in all of the homes, uh, but we know where the worst ones were, and um, it, it seems to me we don't have any real justification for spending public money uh, to pay for profit uh, as opposed to paying for care. Would you be able to expand on that and what the, ex the, the uh, data show uh, in terms of the difference between the outcomes during the pandemic between the for-profit and the not-for-profit? Well, the Toronto Star did a very good analysis about uh, where uh, infections and deaths uh, took place. But, uh, and they showed quite convincingly um, that the uh, rates of both were, well, especially the rates of, of deaths from COVID were significantly higher in the for-profit than in the not-for-profit sector. Not in all of the for-profit homes, for sure. Uh, but the overall, that was the overall uh, pattern. So, um, you know, we, we're always talking about general patterns, right? We're not talking about uh, absolutes here. So, so that the rates were higher there. And, um, and to reiterate that we know the staffing levels are, are lower. And 
staffing is absolutely the central component in care. How many you have and uh, what kinds of supports they have are, are really uh, critical. That uh, we have too many part-time jobs. The majority of personal support workers in Canada, in Ontario, only have part-time jobs. That's, that's just not good enough. We, if you think of care as requiring continuity so that the person who's looking after you knows you, knows what you need, knows um, what can really ir irritate you and what doesn't, uh, then you need full-time employment for people. And of course, those people who do the jobs need full-time employment too. I want to go back to something you said uh, quickly, and that is about the regulation that you know, we need to have proper standards and enforce them. Who should be responsible for that? Is it a provincial or is it a federal responsibility? Both. I'll go back to where you asked me earlier about Canada's reputation for a public health care system. Why do we have that? We have it because we had federal legislation based on standards. We need that in long-term care. We had fed, not just federal standards, but federal standards that were enforced, at least initially. We need that in long-term care. The federal government has more uh, economic clout. They can uh, raise money more easily. We need their money at the provincial level, but they shouldn't just give us the money. Even though we hear the provinces saying, oh, stay out of our backyard, this is our business, just give us the money. Uh, at the same time, when a municipality says to them, just give us the money, they won't do that. Um, of course, you should be able to say where that money is going to be spent. And if we're going to really address the national issues in Canada <clears throat> that have become so obvious with COVID, we need federal leadership and we need that leadership to not just be more money, but more money based on uh, meeting certain kinds of standards. And then at the provincial level, and, and again, to go back to the County Health Act, what it allows is you to meet those standards in different ways. And we could uh, set up those standards so that, that there were flexibility for the Yukon compared to Ontario, for instance, which has very different needs and populations and requirements. But at the same time, you can still make it accessible and make sure that, that uh, it you address issues of, of major cultural differences, that you address issues around racism and, uh, and as well as around issues like staffing, and that we, we should all be able to agree on shared values that are behind the kind of system we want and, and try and get there through a set of standards that we can agree on. And they, they would be more detailed at the provincial level because the province would then translate those major principles and values into practice. Um, and then at the municipal level, we also have uh, requirements because municipalities are close to people. And, uh, and they too uh, have some responsibility in this area to make sure some standards are met. Uh, Roy Romano, when he uh, did the Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada said, it's what kind of healthcare system we have is a matter of values uh, and political will. I think we need to use those values and those political will, that political will, to set up standards at the national level and at the provincial level that get implemented. And that those standards have have to begin by valuing both the people who need the care and the people who provide the care. I have a couple of questions as we round off. This has been really fascinating, um, looking at this, the long-term care from the very beginning and to where we are now. Uh, in terms of the study you have done, uh, looking at various systems around the world, um, have you seen a for-profit model anywhere else that uh, was working well for the country, the society in which it operated? No. <laughs> and 
I would say the same thing about models. Um, we did a, a study for the city of Toronto, actually, on, on various models, mo many of which come out of the United States, actually. Eden, greenhouse, butterfly, butterfly comes out of the, uh, the UK. Um, uh, and we've been in, uh, we, we, when I say we've been in, we, we took a team of 12 to 14 people into a long-term care home in each of these countries, stayed for over the course of a week, um, and uh, we interviewed and observed during uh, those times. So we were in homes that practiced all of these models. They all have benefits, there's no question, but there is no one perfect model. It really depends on the population, on the uh, location, on um, what what kind of staff there can be uh, available. Uh, we can learn from them all. Uh, and I think we can learn from all of these other countries. I hear a lot these days, oh, Denmark is our model. Well, Denmark has the same, about the same population as Toronto. Um, you know, it, it makes a difference. And it's a much less culturally diverse and racially diverse country than, than Toronto, <laughs> you know. Um, and and uh, so we can learn from them. We can learn from all of these countries, but then we can uh, figure out what we can learn from them in ways that we can design our own system, I think. And do, do profits work? Well, the, it, it, what's happened in Norway is that they've started to um, get rid of the, the small number of for-profit corporate homes they had they've reduced their number rather than expand their number. That's a lesson there. And Norway is, if I'm not mistaken, always ranking very high on uh, when there's a survey about the satisfaction of life and how happy people are in, in that country. So let's learn from Norway. The final question I had is uh, based on demographic trends, and you mentioned this earlier, where we're an aging population. If the status quo remains with our structure where we have 58% of beds in the for-profit hands, what do you see as um, happening in terms of long-term care for Canadians? Well, I don't think the quality will improve in those homes. I don't see that. I mean, maybe if we... Um, develop and enforce more standards, um, that quality would improve. But I suspect that the quality would improve at the expense of their profits and they would become less interesting places to invest, um, which is what I would hope would happen, that, uh, that they would become less interesting and uh, places to invest. I mean, we still, and I want to repeat this, that we still have to improve what happens in the not-for-profits and in the uh, in the municipal homes. Um, they, they all have a long way to go before they uh, provide the kind of care people want and need uh, or the kind of work that, uh, that people want to have when they are employed in these places. Um, but uh, there's no, I don't, I think that research evidence is pretty clear that we're better off in uh, not-for-profit and uh, uh, municipal homes and that that's where we should be focusing our attention. We also need, uh, need more uh, beds. I know there's a, a lot of pressure to say that we should be looked after at home. There, and to, as I said earlier, there are lots of people without homes. And uh, in, we have interviewed so many women who have just reached the breaking point trying to provide uh, care in the home 24 hours a day. And uh, it, there are people who really need the kind of 24-hour care that we provide in long-term care. So the question is, how can we do that in a way that isn't um, feeling like an institution, but feels like um, a place where we want to be, where you'd want to be. And I think that we all have a responsibility to start thinking about what kind of place would I like to be in if that was the case for me, where I needed some kind of nursing care or some kind of social care for 24 hours a day.
That's what we need to think about. And um, this is our most vulnerable population. So this could be you tomorrow. Well, as you said, (laughs) as you said, uh, we're all aging. That's a a inescapable fact that we're all, if we're lucky enough, we're going to be there. We're, um, we're 80, 90, um, and we need more care than we can have at home. But I think that it, we, there are also some great ideas out there, right? I mean, like, we should have more mixed populations. We were in a place in, in Sweden where alternate floors were students. So there are young people coming and going, you know. It's not just a whole bunch of old people together. <laughs> now, some old people like to be uh, some of my best friends. But, but, uh, but on the other hand, to think about ways we can construct uh, 24-hour care in, in ways that to bring generations together without putting uh, an enormous workload and pressure, especially on women, um, in terms of, of looking after people who need that 24-hour care. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Well, that covers the the questions I have. As we round up, is there anything that we haven't touched on that uh, you'd like to leave with our uh, viewers at goldenvoices.com on the Golden Years Fireside Chat series? I just think we all need to remember that um, we need to invest in care and uh, to think about what we what that care means. COVID brought that on the front burner, whereas uh, it may have been in the back burner for most of us. We we know it's something we must focus on. Right. Thank you so much for your time, Pat. It was a delight speaking with you, and you've shared so uh, such rich insights into this area. Very important topic for all of us to think about. Thank you once again. Thank you for your interest in the area. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the Golden Years Fireside Chat series where we focused on long-term care and specifically the for-profit model in long-term care. And we had the benefit of the research of our expert today. I am Celia Sanker, Executive Director of the Diversity Canada Foundation, the organization that brings you the goldenvoices.com portal where seniors gather to focus on issues of importance to seniors. Here we can find the Golden Years Fireside Chat series, this one on long-term care and several others on various topics under the theme of living longer and living well. We look forward to you joining us for other episodes in the Golden Years Fireside Chat series. Until next time, take good care of yourself. Bye for now.